we will start with our typical thing of going over the warm ups. So let me go get into the warm up here and share. All right, so for the warm up. In systemic circulation, low levels of oxygen in a particular area of tissue will lead to, and here most people got it, local vasodilation. Um, again, if you dilate the, the blood vessels, it's going to reduce resistance, increase the flow into the region. Um, I'll mention one more thing about, about this. Um, when, we, when we're done covering the quiz, there's little odds and ends I realize I should have mentioned. Um, veins, again, most people got this. Um, the smooth muscle, remember, in the veins is purely to adjust the diameter. It's not to keep the blood flowing. What actually helps keep the blood flowing, even though the pressure is really low in the veins? The valves. There's one way valves. What skeletal is, muscle. The skeletal muscle. Yeah, the surrounding skeletal muscle that's kind of squeezing and milking them. We talked about one other thing. It helps drive the return of the blood back to the heart. The respiratory pump. Yeah, that respiratory pump. The changes in your thoracic pressure as you're breathing help kind of also kind of pump the um, the chambers of the heart and the you know the vena cava and keep it keep it moving back with the one-way valves. Um, <clears throat> everybody got this about three liters of water leak out of your capillary beds. Why does it leak? What causes that leakage out of the capillary beds? What's driving that loss of water? Is it hydrostatic? Yeah, it's that hydrostatic pressure. It's basically that water pressure and you know, going through these really thin, leaky capillaries. And we talked about at the far end of the capillary bed, most of the water is actually reabsorbed via osmosis but there's a net loss of about three liters that has to get recovered by the lymphatic capillaries or else you'll get edema. Um, platelets initiate the cascade of events known as hemostasis when, and again, most people got this opposed to collagen, which is the protein that makes up the connective tissue. Definitely not. If, if they started every time they were exposed to endothelium, you would just constantly be blood clotting because endothelium is the de facto standard lining of your blood vessels. So that's when everything is cool is when they see endothelium. That's actually going to prevent them from activating. Yeah, and they are not activated by the nervous system either. Uh -huh. And here, everybody got the sinusoidal capillaries. Okay. So any questions about any of those broad topics? I was a little confused. It wasn't in the quiz, but the meta arterials and how they help the blood in the capillary beds. So those are basically kind of a place for the blood to go from one side to the other if they're not actually going through the capillary bed proper. Here, I'll, I'll, it's easier to draw than to, to describe in words. When would they go through the meta arterials versus the um, capillary bed? When the precapillary sphincter is closed. So here's like some arterial coming in, some venule coming out. Let's get the capillaries in there. Do, 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 do. 
And this is like a little, little circle of smooth muscle that can pinch this off. And the meta arterial, maybe I'll draw it in like yellow. Is basically this connection from one side to the other. So blood is coming in. It's flowing in. If the capillary bed is open, that sphincter is relaxed, then it will perfuse. It'll kind of flood into the tissue here. But like I mentioned, like, you know, in your muscles right now, 90% of the capillary beds are closed off because you don't need that much blood going into your muscles if you're not actually being active. So the capillary, precapillary sphincter is closed off. Then the blood comes up to here instead of just being stuck and not moving, which we know is not good when the blood isn't moving, it's more likely to form clots and stuff like that. You know, it just has a place to continue its um, circulation. So that's what the meta arterial is. It allows there to be a complete circuit, even if that precapillary sphincter is closed off and not allowing the blood to enter into the capillary bed. So, all right, check. Um, so remember I was talking about local autoregulation. Um, so, you know, in the quiz, we just said, like, if there's like, you know, low oxygen in the tissue, then you're going to have your vessels, you know, there's going to be vasodilation. Um, if there's chronically low oxygen in the tissue, even if you're dilating, you're trying to get more, um, you know, more blood, more oxygen, nutrients but there's still not enough, that's going to trigger what we call angiogenesis. Angiogenesis just means creation of more blood vessels. So ultimately, if there's not enough, um, you know, supply of oxygen and nutrients to a, re to a region, it's actually going to create extra blood vessels growing that will help um, perfuse the area. So that's what angiogenesis means. Um, so angiogenesis, other things, oh, other odds and ends I was thinking about. So endothelium, which we just mentioned in the quiz as the lining of the blood vessels. And we said as a tissue, it's just simple squamous epithelium. Um, it has one other name that you should be familiar with because it's used kind of interchangeably. Um, it's also called the tunica intima, you know, of the vessel, of blood vessel. You know, like the most intimate coat, the, the lining that is the most inside. Um, so a lot of times if you're reading something about that's affecting the um, the endothelium, they'll sometimes they'll call it the intima instead. So if you ever see this word intima in um, the context of blood vessels, it's just the endothelium, which is just the simple squamous epithelium lining the blood vessels. So you should recognize these two as Synonyms. Um, and then the last thing before we leave the cardiovascular system for good, I realized I should um, talk about anemia. So anemia is when you're not getting enough oxygen to your tissues. 
Right? We talked about shock where there's just not enough blood flow or perfusion. But anemia, there could be blood flow, but you're not getting enough oxygen. You know, and that can come from a variety of reasons. Um, obviously, if, you know, what's the main thing that's carrying your, um, carrying the oxygen around? The hemoglobin. The hemoglobin, exactly. So if you have things that affect your ability to make hemoglobin, like iron deficiency, Right. Iron was at the core of the heme group to bind the oxygen. So you can have iron deficiency anemia because you're not making adequate hemoglobin to carry the oxygen around. Um, you can get anemia because you just don't have enough blood. You can have hemorrhagic anemia. And I hate this word. It spells. I always I forget exactly. It spells some. Uh, please don't. Don't use, look it up before you spell it for real on something that matters. I'm pretty good with spelling except for that word. Um, there's iron deficiency anemia. You can get anemia from things that destroy the ability to make blood cells. Um, blood cells, when we talk about blood cells getting made, where are, where are, blood, cell, where are blood cells made? Bone marrow. Yeah, so blood. It could be sickle cell anemia. What's that? Sickle cell anemia. So we, we will get to that, but first I'm going to cover okay. the one. So blood's formed in the bone marrow. Um, you know, I should give you the, the hematopoiesis is the official word for making of blood. Um, so we talk about hematopoietic tissue. It's the red marrow in particular. It's found like in your flat bones, like your skull and your sternum and in your hip bones and your vertebrae in the proximal ends of like your humerus and your femurs. Um, most of your bones are actually filled with fat adipose, but there's a few places that have this red marrow. I should say red bone marrow. Um, and when babies, babies have red marrow everywhere because they have to make blood like nobody's business. But once you're an adult, you just have a few places where you have this going on. Um, if you're in radiation treatment or something for um, cancer or something, that can, you know, it's going to be killing off lots of rapidly dividing cells, including the cells making your, your, your blood cells. So you can have what's called aplastic anemia. This is if you are um, having things that actually interfere with this, just the production of the blood, like from radiation that killed off bone marrow. Um, you also, this also is gonna like get white blood cells. What's gonna happen if you don't have enough white blood cells? You're immunocompromised? Yeah, you're going to be immunocompromised, exactly. Um, other kinds, so some, I forget who it was, somebody just mentioned sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is when you have one base pair that's off on the genetic code to make hemoglobin. And that one, one base pair is enough to make the hemoglobin clump to itself in a weird way that makes the whole blood, you know, normally a blood cell is, um, it looks kind of like that biconcave disc. That's a normal red blood cell. In sickle cell anemia, especially under low oxygen conditions, they kind of fold in on themselves and that's what they, they're called sickled. So they kind of fold and then they start um, blocking they, they can't they don't go through the capillaries and you don't get adequate flow through the tissue so sickle cell anemia is when you have this one base pair off on the on the hemoglobin and it causes this thing where the whole blood cell folds in on itself again if you and people probably know the story like one hit of sickle cell anemia gene 
isn't going to be fatal, but actually seems to be protective of malaria. Um, you know, the little malaria parasite lives in blood cells. Um, but if you get like a homozygous hit of the sickle cell gene, then it's really bad. And you've got this really kind of tragic condition. Um, other kinds of anemia. You can have vitamin deficiencies that make it, that impair your ability to um, make blood cells. Um, if you have a B12 deficiency, it's called pernicious anemia. We'll talk about vitamin B12 absorption in the stomach later on. That's happening. You absorb it in the stomach um, using this thing called intrinsic factor. But pernicious anemia is when you don't have this vitamin necessary for the formation of your blood cells, among other things. Um, so just kind of giving you a sense. There's lots of things that can go wrong that affect the ability to provide adequate oxygen to your tissue. Um, and I should mention like carbon monoxide, CO. Why does, you know, most people have heard of carbon monoxide poisoning. You know, why is it a bad idea to go into the garage and keep your, in a closed garage and just have your car idling and fall asleep in the car? Why are you gonna probably end up being dead? Or if you do a barbecue in the house, and if you try to like keep warm with a little fire in a in a sealed off room, you'll also probably. Does it bind to hemoglobin? Exactly. So carbon monoxide, it binds hemoglobin, but with about a two hundred times the affinity of oxygen. So carbon monoxide, even if you have oxygen around in the, in the room, if there's carbon monoxide, it's going to grab on to the hemoglobin and not let go. So then your red blood cells are not going to be able to transport the oxygen because the binding site is taken up by the carbon monoxide. Yeah, and people get confused. Um, CO is not CO2, right? This is carbon dioxide. This is just the stuff you exhale. Carbon monox, and this is all, you know, this, this isn't gonna kill you as long as it's not in excess. But CO is um, one oxygen in a carbon. It's often formed as a product of incomplete combustion. But, you know, normally when you have combustion, you end up just with water and carbon dioxide. It's all good, but incomplete combustion, often you get um, products, including carbon monoxide, you know, which is why, you know, running, you know, running a heater that's not properly vented, you know, can kill, you know, can kill everybody in the apartment because the carbon monoxide builds up and, and, um, and what's weird, supposedly, people who die of carbon monoxide poisoning. Normally, if you are anoxic, you don't have enough oxygen, you turn blue, there's the word cyanotic. Cyanotic means blue. So normally you kind of look, if somebody's looking kind of blue, that's a sign that they're not getting enough oxygen. Um, there's places you can actually look. Obviously, if someone has darker skin, it's harder to see just through their skin because of skin pigmentation. But there's different places you can look to see the bluish as well. So people definitely use this as a diagnostic if someone's not getting enough oxygen, if they're turning bluish, um, because hemoglobin gets kind of more dark when it doesn't have 
oxygen bound. But because the carbon monoxide binds so tightly, it actually turns it even brighter red than normal. So supposedly people who are found dead of carbon monoxide poison are like really kind of bright pink because the um, hemoglobin binds the carbon monoxide super tightly and turns really red. Um, so I think that's it. That's the odds and ends I wanted to kind of take care of. So before we go into the respiratory system, is there any last questions about the cardiovascular? And we've covered a lot of ground there. Okie dokie. So the respiratory system, you know, what is it doing? What are the functions? Gas exchange. So it's gonna, it's gonna be gas exchange. We're gonna have air, you know, oxygen in the room that we want in our blood and carbon dioxide in our blood that we wanna get out and push out into the room. That's yeah, a big job, probably the main job of the respiratory system. But it does a few other things as well that we should we should mention. What other what other jobs does it do? What I'm doing right now as I'm flapping my lips. Talking. Yeah, talking. Right, that's all about creating an airflow and going over your vocal cords and vibrating them and all that. Right, if you're choking and you can't breathe, one of the problems is you can't tell anybody you're choking to death because you can't talk. You have to go like. Um, and we'll talk about this pH balance. The respiratory system is actually going to be actually pretty important in pH homeostasis. Um, basically, we'll, when we get to the transport of carbon dioxide in the blood in a little bit, you'll see that carbon dioxide is transformed into carbonic acid um, once it's in the blood and then bicarbonate ions. Um, so by um, breathing deeper or more shallowly, you change the levels of carbon dioxide in your body, which changes the amount of carbonic acid, which changes your pH. So by breathing deeper or more shallowly, it's actually going to be an important part of pH balance when we get to that more formally. Um, Okie dokie. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay out the um, kind of mo the, the, most, the most important um, parts of this, and then we will go more into detail about each of them. Okay, I just knocked, hold on a sec. This is always one of those funny things when you have like reading glasses, and then you knock the arm off them, but then you have to put them back together, but you usually have the glasses to help you see close enough. All right, I think they're on. All right, so first part is going to be what we call pulmonary ventilation. So this is getting the air from the room down into your lungs where you can actually move it into your bloodstream and then pushing it out of your lungs into the room. You know, so we'll talk about this in detail, the mechanics of it. It's going to be about changing volume of your thoracic cavity and changing pressures and, you know, air flowing along the pressure. I mean, 
this is going to be the same basic idea of flow and pressure and resistance that we saw with blood, except we'll be looking at airflow. You know, air flows along the pressure gradient. You know, so we're going to create pressures, air pressure differences that will cause the airflow in and out of the lungs. So we'll look at this. We have what's called external respiration. You know, once the air is in the lungs, we need to move it into the blood. So this is going to be basically oxygen goes into the blood. You know, this is also going to be driven by pressure differences. Um, since we're just going to be thinking about oxygen instead of the air as a total, we're going to be looking specifically at the partial pressures of oxygen or the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Um, if you remember, um, or if, if you haven't, it, yeah, no, you all took chemistry. So partial pressures, right? If you have, you know, air is a mix of all sorts of things. It's, you know, mainly nitrogen and then also some oxygen and well, some CO2 and different things. And, you know, overall, you know, the air in the room is at one atmosphere, 760 torr or millimeters of mercury. And if you want to look at this total pressure of the air, it's going to be an additive partial pressure of each of the components of that gas. So the total pressure of air pressure at sea level is 760 millimeters of mercury. You know, and 20% of that is coming from the oxygen. About 80% is coming from the nitrogen. So that's all the partial pressures are. It's like, what is the proportional contribution to the um, entire air pressure from the different gases that make up that air? Um, so we'll be looking at the partial pressure of oxygen, which is, again, it's about, you know, if we're going to get more formally, it's like 21% of the air is oxygen. So 21% of this overall pressure of air at sea level is actually contributed by the partial pressure of the oxygen. Um, yeah, and so we're going to have to look at what's the partial pressure of the oxygen in the alveoli down in the lungs. What's the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood? And which way is the oxygen going to move? It's going to move along its pressure gradient from high to low pressure. That's, remember, flow. Flow is just going to be, you know, pressure divided by resistance. Right, whether we're talking about blood flow or airflow, if there is some pressure gradient, the air is going to flow from high to low pressure. If there's resistance, you're going to need more pressure to get the same amount of flow. This should start feeling kind of intuitive by now, especially after you've been knocking your head against the cardiovascular stuff for so long. You know, it's one of the nice things about all of these kind of um, basic physics relationships, whether you're talking about flow of electricity, you know, flow of electric charge, and, you know, there the pressure is the voltage, actually, or whether you're talking about flow of air, and then you have air pressure differences, or the flow of blood, in which case you have these, you know, pressure differences in the fluid. Um, blah, blah, blah. Three. You know, then there's transport. You know, once the once the oxygen's in the blood, we got to move it around, and you're all experts on that at this point. That's what we've just been spending the last couple of weeks looking at in detail, is how you actually get the blood moving from one place to another and get it to pick up the oxygen and deliver it and all that. Um, four. The thing they call internal respiration. So this is where you have so O2 in the blood has to go to O2 delivered into the tissues. 
Um, we'll look at this in a little bit of detail because this is going to depend on the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen, right? In order for the oxygen to be released into the tissue, we have to have the oxygen let go of the hemoglobin and diffuse out into the tissue space. And the conditions in the tissue space actually are going to affect hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen and affect like how much of the oxygen is actually released into the tissues and all that. So we're going to look at that in a little bit of detail. The whole we call the hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curve and all that. So, so again, pulmonary ventilation, getting the air down into the lungs in the first place from the just the room. External respiration, moving the oxygen from the lungs into the bloodstream so it can then get transported to your tissues. And then once it's in the tissues, you need to get the oxygen out of the blood into the, into the cells around it. You know, and obviously, what do the cells do with the oxygen once they got it? Why do we want it? Why do you have to deliver oxygen to the cells in the first place? Make ATP. And through what process? Cellular respiration. Yeah, exactly. So, and again, we've already covered cellular respiration in excruciating detail. Um, we've covered the transport in excruciating detail. So what we're gonna do now is focus on pulmonary ventilation, external respiration, and a little bit on the internal respiration. So, um, to start this, we do have to talk a bit about the anatomy of the whole system because, again, it's kind of mentioned this, you can't really talk about how a car engine works if you don't know what a piston is um, or what an axle is or a crankshaft or something. So in order to understand pulmonary ventilation or any of that, you actually have to see how it's all put together. So let's do that. Okay, it's going to be kind of like a cross section of somebody. It's going to be a nasal cavity that comes in from the nose. Oral cavity that comes from the mouth. And then they join in the back here. So let me maybe use a... This is my nasal cavity, and this is my oral cavity, and this is my throat. So, the throat is also known as the pharynx. Right, and if you've been, if you've done anatomy, you know there's actually different parts of the pharynx. You can call it the nasopharynx if you're up here, the oropharynx if you're here, the laryngopharynx if you're here. But you know, for this class, it's just all the pharynx basically. This is supposed to be your tongue. Um. And then this is going to go down and notice this is going to be a common common um, pathway both for air when you're breathing either through your nose or your mouth or for food if you're swallowing food chewing it up you can put your teeth in here um, so the pharynx is going to have both air and um, food going through so we're going to have to make sure we got a little protector over your main airways to make sure the food doesn't go down when you're swallowing food and cause you to choke. Um, and actually by the same same um, same idea, 
you don't want food to get up into your nasal cavity. If you're like chewing, you know, let's say you're drinking milk or something. It's like, oh, here's my glass of milk. <laughs> you don't want it coming up in here and coming out your nose. Um, so you have like the soft palate with the little uvula hanging off it. The uvula is that, right, if you're like looking down in the back of somebody's throat and there's that little doohickey. F Let me shoot it. The uvula is that little doohickey hanging off of the top of your soft palate there. And that basically kind of folds up when you are swallowing to make sure the food doesn't go up into the nasal cavity. Right. And that's like, obviously it is possible. Like the classic thing when you're laughing and so hard, the milk comes out your nose is because you're actually like oh, forcing the, the milk up into the nasal cavity and out your nose. Um, similarly, we're going to have a thing down as we get down lower, this is going to be the trachea, which is going to be to the lungs. But obviously, we also have to be going down to the stomach. So the esophagus going to the stomach. Right, because this tube, the pharynx, has got both food and air. So it's going to have to branch either going toward the stomach or to the lungs. So there's a little, a little flappy doodle thing here called the epiglottis. You know, that epiglottis, which is kind of right at the top of your larynx. We're going to talk about the larynx in more detail in a few moments. So larynx is kind of your Adam's apple, your voice box. And right above, right at the entrance to the larynx is this epiglottis, which basically seals over when you're swallowing food to make sure that the food doesn't go down your trachea into your lungs. Again, if food does go down there, that's when you're like choking or coughing, <coughs> trying to get it out of there. Um, again, we're going to look at the epiglottis and the larynx in a little more detail, but you can, again, you can think of uvula keeps food from going up into your nasal cavity. Epiglottis keeps food from going down towards your lungs. Um, you can actually, if you like um, put your finger on your Adam's apple and you swallow, you'll feel the whole um, larynx, the Adam's apple kind of right up and then drop back down. That's that process of kind of pushing up and sealing off the epiglottis. Like if you should, if you touch your Adam's apple and swallow, you'll just feel it kind of right up and drop back down. So that motion is sealing off the entrance to your larynx and making sure that the food doesn't go down into your lungs and you don't choke. Um, so more things we can talk about this, um, which let's talk about ways we deal with like kind of dust, right? There's, if you've ever just looked at like air, or like, you know, sun coming in through a window or something and you notice like, oh my God, there's a lot of dust in the air. And actually and there's lots of stuff you can't see. Even every car driving by is spewing crap out of its tailpipe, even if you don't see it and you're breathing it in. So you're breathing in big things like dust. You're breathing in more microscopic things like little particulate matter. And we need to come up with ways to filter and make sure that we don't just have our lungs completely clogged up with crap. So let's talk about ways you can deal with all of the dust and particulate stuff you breathe in. Um, 
So one thing It sounds silly, but you know what we call vibrissy. Your nose hairs. You know, your nares, your nostrils have hairs that are going to catch like a big piece of dust that you're trying to breathe in. That's going to get trapped by those nose hairs. Vibrissy is just the fancy word for nose hair. Um, another thing is the um, lining of all your respiratory passages, whether you're in the nasal cavity or then down through the trachea and the bronchi leading down to the lungs, we have this, what we call this respiratory epithelium. Which is, again, you don't need to remember the details. You know, if you're in anatomy, you need to know it. The pseudo stratified, ciliated, columnar, epithelium with goblet cells, right? I'm sure you know, remember if, if you've been in anatomy, you're like, oh yeah. Basically, things to know about this epithelium is it's ciliated, so it's got little cilia that are waving back and forth. In goblet cells, these make mucus. And there's also mucus glands underneath the epithelium down in this, um, in the lamina propria and submucosa that are also pushing up lots of mucus. So basically, we have a layer of mucus Oops, mucus over a bunch of these little waving cilia, little hair like things that, whoops, are waving back and forth. So if we look in here, this is all covered in mucus. And the mucus is all getting swept to the back of the throat. Actually, for completeness, I should put in, here's my esophagus. So the mucus is getting swept. If you're down low, it's getting swept up. If you're up, you're getting swept down. So this mucus is kind of like flypaper, right? It's sticky. So as you're breathing stuff in, um, dust and particles stick to it, and they get trapped. And then the little cilia constantly keep the flow to the back of the throat where it collects right in the back of your throat and then you swallow and it goes down into your stomach down into like the ph2 acid where it gets you know dealt with um right if this is something you don't kind of like the same way you don't know that you're you don't usually think about your adam's apple bobbing up and down every time you swallow it's a similar thing. If you think about it right now, I bet you you're going to realize like, oh my God, I got to swallow. Like you're constantly swallowing as the mucus kind of travels and um, congregates down at the back of your throat and you swallow. It's just part of the way your respiratory system, you know, deals with all the dust. Um, sometimes they call this like the like the mucus escalator or elevator because it's like kind of moving up and up constantly. Um, it's also part of like one of the things smoking can do is paralyze the little cilia. In which case the mucus doesn't automatically move up to the back to get gut to get get rid of. Instead, you go <coughs> kind of manually have to kind of get it up out of there. Um, so other things that kind of keep, you know, actually the um, nasal cavities here, they have these things called, they're either called conchi. Um, they're basically like these swirls. If you like look, you know, 
if you cut somebody's nose off, it's the nasal cavity actually looks like this crazy thing with all these little baffles and stuff. So when you breathe air in, the air doesn't just kind of go in. The air goes like looping all over the place as you breathe in. Um, and that's going to help make sure that any dust that's in there actually hits the mucus that's lining all of these surfaces. So when you breathe in, so you hit these conchi, they're also called turbinates. Turbinates is just a um, synonym for conchi. Just means when you breathe in, the air swirls around, so the dust is very likely to whack into the mucus and get stuck. So having the nasal cavity with these conchi and the turbinates, this helps with the filtering of the air by getting the dust and stuff stuck. Um, the other thing that the nasal cavity does is it helps kind of warm and humidify the air. Right. If you think about the lung tissue, the lung tissue, when we get to it, it's going to be really delicate. It's actually simple squamous epithelium, really thin cells to maximize the ability to diffuse oxygen into the bloodstream. But it means it's like the most delicate kind of tissue papers, kind of tissue. That's just funny tissue paper. Um, it's the most delicate kind of tissue you can have. So you want as much as possible not have dry, you know, dry, um, freezing air damaging this delicate tissue down here. So by breathing through your nose, you're kind of conditioning the air and warming it and humidifying it before it actually makes it down into the more delicate tissues down there. So in general, it's, it's better to breathe through your nose than through your mouth because the air is then going to be kind of preconditioned before it goes down there. Um, so we talked about vibrissi to deal with dust, this respiratory epithelium, the mucus, along with the cilia. Again, the cilia are important because the cilia sweep the mucus to the back of the throat where it can be disposed of. Um, other things, you have um, respiratory things like sneezing and coughing. <coughs> Those are about clearing stuff out that have made it down into your um, into your respiratory passages. Um, what's the difference between a sneeze and a cough? One goes out the nose, one goes out the mouth. Exactly. Well, well, yeah, one goes out the nose, but and then functionally, so that is, tr that's good, that's true. And functionally, what are they clearing out? A sneeze is clearing out your nasal cavity and a cough is yeah. your lungs or trachea. So it's exactly right, right? So the sneeze is directing the explosive blast through your upper respiratory tract to kind of clear something that's stuck up there in your nasal cavity. A cough, this is clearing something out that is stuck in the lower respiratory tract here. So cough versus sneeze, they're both explosive blasts of air, but they're directed differently to clear out different problem areas. Um, so um, we're gonna find, once we get down into the actual alveoli of the lungs, there's gonna be one final last um, defense against dust or particles or particulates that make it all the way down to the actual alveoli, the little chambers in the lungs where the gas exchange is happening. We'll talk about them a little later a bit more, but I'll introduce them. You also have the alveolar macrophages down here. Macrophage, big eaters. These are white blood cells that just are like big amoebas on patrol that move around. And if they find some particulates, 
they gobble, they eat them up, and they can actually travel around, deposit them off in mediastinal lymph nodes and all that. Um, they have a cool name. I like their um, I like their nickname. They're called dust cells. Right, so you constantly have these white blood cells, which are basically like little amoebas that are just patrolling all over the place in the lining, you know, in your alveoli and stuff and eating stuff that shouldn't be there and cleaning stuff out. Um, so these are all ways you're trying to, you know, your system tries to keep from getting crap down into your lungs. Um, Anything else I need to say here? All right, so what we're going to do now, we're going to focus a little bit more on the larynx, which is basically going to be kind of the entry into the um, windpipe, into the trachea. That's going to be where we find the epiglottis and also where we find the vocal cords. I just want to mention just briefly kind of what that is about. Um, hold on, I'm going to... Like I said, the esophagus comes off the back. Trachea is going to be on the front. This is the larynx. Um, the larynx, again, we're not going to get into the real complicated anatomy of it. It's got different um, cartilages that support it. Um, the front one, the thyroid cartilage is the big one that you feel. That's your Adam's apple. Um, again, the top, the entrance to the larynx is the epiglottis. And again, the epiglottis is critical because that's the little um, protector to make sure when you're swallowing food that the food can't get down into your trachea and go down into your lungs and choke you. Um, the other thing that we find in the larynx that we're gonna, that you, you do need to know about are the vocal cords. So the vocal cords are these kind of folds. In fact, let's, um, we're going to do is we're going to like decapitate this person and we're going to just look straight down into their larynx here. And what you're going to see is here's the larynx. And you'll see the vocal cords kind of as these flaps that come in on either side. They're called vocal cords, also called vocal folds. And basically, as air goes up, they vibrate, right? It's kind of like just like a, you know, a reed or something. They vibrate in response to the air flowing over them, and they make a buzz. Um, it is important to know that they only make a buzz. They don't actually make, even we say they're vocal cords, they don't make your vocalizations beyond just making a buzz. Um, everything else, like when I'm talking, that's going to be like my tongue and my mouth and everything creating the more complicated, like the fricatives with my teeth on my lips or plosives when I'm like, or, you know, just all my vowel sounds are just changing the shape of my mouth. E -a 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 -a. Right. That's all kind of not the vocal cords. The vocal cords are making a basic buzz, and then everything else I'm doing is my, my mouth and tongue and all of that, and lips. Um, vocal cords can change pitch. They can go, right? We talked about how things, when we talked about the basilar membrane, things that are kind of more tight, vibrate faster. I showed you like with a string on the guitar.
um, you can adjust the um, tension on these vocal cords and change the pitch on them. Basically, you kind of rock the larynx back and forth. It changes the tension on the vocal cords. So you can make them like ee, 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 ee. It's just changing the tension on the vocal cords. Um, and then the other thing you can do with the vocal cords, there are these little, they're called the arytenoid cartilages that allow them to swing back and forth. So the little space in between the two vocal cords, we call the glottis. So you can actually open or close the vocal cords, kind of like little swinging um, curtains, and you can block off the glottis. Like if you want to build up pressure for a cough, you have to like close the glottis <clears throat> and then open it and let the explosive air leave out through your, through your throat. Or you're bearing down for a bowel movement, like right? You push making all that pressure in there you don't want it escaping out so you close the glottis so you can use the vocal cords to vibrate at different pitches and you can also use them to open and close the glottis to either allow air to flow or not to flow um the other thing we should mention about um now that we're getting like to the trachea in fact let's we're going to do now we're going to like leave this part behind and we're going to kind of follow now what happens to the air as we start following the trachea down into the lungs. So one thing we should mention about the trachea, and then we're going to actually start branching. We call it the respiratory tree because there's all this branching, kind of like a tree. You know, the bronchi, we, we say there's primary bronchi, there's secondary bronchi. Right, there's bronch primary bronchi go into the right and the left, secondary bronchi go into the lobes of the lung. Right, you only have two lobes on the left side because the heart takes up some space. So you have fewer lobes on the left than on the right. And then these keep branching into tertiary bronchi and blah, blah, blah. Um, and finally, so all of this, so this is what we call the conducting zone. All of this stuff, the trachea, the bronchi, and the little, the little dinky ones are the bronchioles we'll talk about in a few moments as well. These are all conducting zone, which means they're bringing the air down to where gas exchange is going to happen, but there's no actual gas exchange. It's basically, in fact, when we get to start talking about the dead space of your respiratory system, this is going to be like the dead space. Right, you bring air down, but nothing is happening here till we actually get down into the actual alveoli, which is where we're going to have the actual gas exchange happening. Which we'll talk, we'll talk about these in more detail. These are going to be what we call like the respiratory zone. Um, there's a lot of branching. There's like 23 orders of branching. We're going to end up with something like 300 million alveoli. Um, so we're going to have a huge surface area for gas exchange. Um, Thing that's different about the airways compared to the blood vessels is, you know, blood 
has this blood pressure and you don't have to worry about a blood vessel really collapsing so much because the blood is kind of inside pushing against the walls. Air, on the other hand, doesn't do that so well. So if you don't have actual physical structural support, the airways will collapse and you're not going to be able to breathe. So we need things to keep the airways patent. Patent is just the um, fancy word for open. Um, and it looks like patent, but it's, it's pronounced patent. Um, so we always, you know, you talk about keeping the airways patent. And a big way that happens is with cartilage support. So like the trachea, we have these little cartilage rings. They're actually, you know, I'm going to say rings in um, quotes. They're actually more like kind of C, right? Because the reality is, you know, you have the trachea, you have the esophagus, the cartilage is kind of in the submucosa here supporting. Right, this is just supposed to. You know, you want to make sure if you're like swallowing down a chunk of hamburger or something that the esophagus can expand and not is not going to go whacking in against this cartilage rings here. That would be silly every time you swallow it goes. Right, so the cartilage in the trachea is more C shaped rather than um, full rings. By the time you get down into the bronchi, it is full rings because there's no esophagus to worry about. As you get further down, instead of having rings, you have more like little reinforcing plates of cartilage. By the time you get down to the smallest things, the bronchioles, these are, they're too small to have like, you know, these more elaborate cartilage and they don't need um, they're not, they don't need something that intense to keep them open. These are held open just by smooth muscle in their walls. So when we look at the bronchioles, these are just smooth muscle, no cartilage. Um, that, uh, let me write that in a way that is actually legible. Um, that smooth muscle in the bronchioles is under control of the autonomic nervous system. Um, what would the sympathetic nervous system do to the bronchioles? Dilate them. It's gonna dilate them, make it less resistance. Remember, it's just like fluid flow, airflow. If you dilate them, make them larger, you reduce the resistance, you're going to make it easier to pull air down and out of your lungs. You know, danger, danger. <sighs> I want to make it easier to get more oxygen down into my body. Um, parasympathetic constricts. It, you get constriction of the bronchioles. Like if you all of a sudden like suck in like a bunch of smoke, you're going to constrict these things, increase resistance, make sure there's less of that getting down into your lung tissue. Um, so the bronchioles can constrict or dilate, which will increase, constrict, de increase or decrease resistance to flow, make it easier or more difficult to get the air in and out of the alveoli. Um, asthma, asthma is an allergic reaction where the bronchioles are constricting. You know, what's that going to cause? If you have, 
your bronchioles just kind of chronically like closing down their diameter? What's what's going to happen? Wouldn't there just be a less gas exchange happening? Um, it's more about the resistance to flow. It's going to mean you're going to have to work a lot harder to get the air down into your lungs and actually, for that matter, get it back out of your lungs. Remember flow? I guess you know. Ready? Remember flow is going to be pressure. divided by resistance. So if resistance is going up due to the constriction of those, we're gonna need a lot more pressure to keep the flow, keep the air coming down in or out. I mean, one of the things about asthma, it's not just difficult getting the air down into your lungs, it's actually difficult trying to get the air out of your lungs as well. So, So bronchial, so this is all conducting zone. Conducting zone, getting the air down the trachea, through the bronchi, finally into the tiny little bronchioles. And ultimately we're gonna get into the alveoli where we actually have the gas exchange happening. Um, so maybe what I'm gonna do now, let's, um, Let's talk about how you actually get the air to flow down into, we're gonna come back to the alveoli. We're gonna talk about what we find there, the different kinds of cells, the things that actually drive the movement of the oxygen from the alveoli into the bloodstream. But let's talk about actual pulmonary ventilation. How do you actually get the air to move from the room down into your lung tissue? Um, we also, actually, actually, uh, yeah, and I should mention lung tissue is also kind of elastic fibers here. It matters that lung is actually kind of elastic. It kind of, oh, yeah, no, okay, I'm going to do this this way. A lot of times I talk about the alveoli first, but I think it'll be kind of fun to do it the other way. Um, all right, so what we're going to do now, right? You open your mouth, air comes in, air comes out. What's making that happen? You know, it's going to have to be because there's pressure differences. Air flows from high pressure to low pressure. So we have to create pressure differences on the two sides. When the pressure is lower in the lungs than the room, the air is going to flow in. When the pressure is higher in my lungs than the room, air is going to flow out. That's going to be exhaling. So what we're going to talk about is how we actually create those pressure differences that cause the air to flow in and the air to flow out. Um, we need to do a little bit more anatomy for this to make sense. All right, so you have to remember the thoracic cavity. Basically, your chest cavity, that's where your lungs and your heart and your esophagus and stuff is. Um, we're going to put highly simplified version of the respiratory system, kind of coming down in. You know, reality is you got two lobes on the left and three lobes on the right. Let's just say... The, the lobes on the left, the lobes on the right, these are supposed to be the lung tissue. 
This is supposed to be the airways coming down. Um, now we need some more anatomy. Um, what did we, what kind of tissues? I introduced these tissues that surround your lungs, surround your digestive organs, surround your heart to reduce the friction. What were those called? Serosa. Yeah, the serosa. So the serosa that surrounds the lungs are the pleura. So the pleura are going to be a critical part of our story here. So I'm going to put in the pleura layer that's against the actual organ. This is going to be my visceral pleura. If you remember, it was a two layer thing with slippery fluid in between. There's going to be a parietal layer, which is going to be against the body wall. So this green is going to be the parietal pleura. And then what's really important for the mechanics of pulmonary ventilation is that there is a suction in between. So again, if you've ever had wet microscope slides, when you're washing microscope slides and you've got two microscope slides, have you ever experienced this of like, you're trying to pull them apart and it's like, damn, I can't pull them apart. They're like stuck. They can slide back and forth, but it's really hard to pull them apart when there's like some water in between the two. So if you pull on this parietal pl pleura, it's going to pull on the visceral pleura. And this is important because the lungs don't have any muscles to move, but your thoracic cavity does, has lots of muscles. There's the, what's the main muscle that makes up the bottom of the thoracic cavity? Diaphragm. Diaphragm. There's the diaphragm. Um, the diaphragm, when it contracts, actually goes down, so it's gonna kind of increase the volume, right? If you think about it, if you think of contracting, maybe making things smaller, but because it tightens up and flattens out, it's actually like enlarging the bottom of the thoracic cavity here. Um, there's other muscles too. There's all sorts of your abdominal muscles, your intercostal muscles, your scalenes, your pec minor. There's all sorts of muscles that can change the volume of your thoracic cavity. And because there's a suction between the parietal and visceral pleura, when you change the volume of the thoracic cavity using your skeletal muscles, you're then gonna actually change the volume of the lungs because it's getting pulled along by the suction. So that suction is gonna be critical for this whole process. Um, the other thing we need to put in here to just complete the story is a little more physics. The old classic Boyle's Law. Let's look at Boyle's Law. So Boyle's law is a relationship between pressure of a gas and the volume of the gas. And it's basically saying pressure is proportional to the inverse of the volume, assuming you have the same amount of gas. And this is actually pretty intuitive if you really think about what pressure is and what a gas is. Remember, a gas you can think of as just little atoms or molecules floating around, zipping everywhere. So if I have a certain amount of gas and they're trapped in a certain volume and they're zipping all over, they're going to be hitting the walls. Whenever they hit the walls of my little box that they're in, they're going to create a force. That's the pressure. Pressure is just force per area. So if I have a certain amount of gas in a certain volume, 
there's going to be a certain amount of whacking into the sides, creating force, creating a pressure. If I take that same amount of gas, but I put them in a bigger box, now they're going to spend more time zipping through space, less time whacking against the walls. So now the pressure is lower. If I take that same amount of gas and I shove them in a smaller box, they're going to spend a lot more time whacking on the walls and my pressure is going to be higher. So this is going to be critical. And when we look at how this works, if the volume is going up, the pressure is going down. If the volume is going down, the pressure is going up. And again, the pressure of the gas is going to be what drives the movement, the flow of the gas. So it's critical to think about where's our higher pressure, lower pressure. All right, so now we come back to our picture here, and we're all good to go. The basic idea here is you can use your muscles, mainly your diaphragm. Your diaphragm is gonna be driving maybe like over 70% of the volume change of your thoracic cavity. Although like your other muscles can, can work it as well especially if you're doing like more forced <gasps> inspirations and stuff like that. But basically it's going to be like this one. You know, diaphragm and other muscles are going to contract. This is going to increase the volume of your thoracic cavity. Right? So this is your diaphragm, intercostal muscles, other ones contract, make your chest cavity bigger than it was. Now, what's going to happen to the pressure of the gas? No, no, actually, because of that plural suction, we're going to have the increase the volume of the lungs, you know, due to the plural suction. So again, this is why it's critical that there is that suction between the two pleura. Um, the muscles can change the size of the thoracic cavity, but they don't change the size of the lungs. The lungs change because they're getting pulled along due to the suction. Now, what's happening to the pressure in the lungs because the volume went up? Decreases. Exactly. So this is going to decrease the pressure in the lungs. And now, because we have a low pressure zone in the lungs compared to the outside, air is going to flow in from the room down into your lungs. So it's really important when you are learning this and when you're answering questions about this on your exam that you think about what's causing what. Um, this is really different than blowing up a balloon, right? When you're blowing up a balloon, you're pushing air into the balloon, increasing the pressure in the balloon and the balloon's getting bigger. That's not at all what's happening here. Um, here, you're, it's basically like you're taking the balloon and you're pulling it so it's bigger, which creates a low pressure zone inside, which then causes air to flow inside to fill it up. Right, so the volume changes first. Again, this volume changes, then the pressure drops, which causes the air to flow in. So the air doesn't flow in until the volume is changed already. This happens way before this. Again, blowing up a balloon is the opposite. The air flows in to increase the pressure and blow up the balloon. Some animal, like a frog, a frog actually does use what's called positive pressure breathing, like gulps the air down into the lungs. 
pushes the air down. But for us, we basically have it open up and increase the volume. And then the air rushes into the low pressure zone. Um, this is all the inhale. Exhaling is going to be mainly passive. It's going to be basically be the opposite. You know, the muscles are going to relax. You know, thoracic volume goes down. Lung volume is then going to go down. Um, the lungs are kind of elastic, so they naturally want to kind of contract and get smaller. I'll talk a little more about why the lungs collapse. They call it lung compliance, um, the elasticity of the lungs. So, the, you know, this is, again, lungs are kind of elastic, so they want to get smaller if they can. Um, once the lung volume goes down, what happens? The pressure is going to increase. Exactly. The pressure in the lung goes up and then air flows out because we have higher pressure in the lungs now than we had in the room. Right? So that makes sense? Um, what happens like Oh, somebody just stabbed or shot this person through the chest. And now they have a hole right here. What is going to happen if there's a hole right here? Blood, blood. Okay, besides from blood. Would they have a hard time exhaling because there's so much pressure? No. Wouldn't it be kind of the opposite? Like they wouldn't be able to. So this suction, what happens if you poke a hole here and you destroy that suction between the two pleura, you have what's called a pneumothorax, means air in the thorax. If you have a pneumothorax and there's no suction, as mentioned, the lungs are elastic. They naturally kind of want to get smaller. The lung will actually get smaller and it will collapse in. Because there's no suction between the pleura anymore to keep pulling and keeping the lung expanded. Normally the lung follows along with the thoracic cavity because of that suction. But if you break that suction by poking a hole in somebody's chest, then the lung collapses. The collapsed lung is called atelectasis. This is the fancy word for collapsed lung. And that happens because you've broken that suction. And without that suction, the lung is no longer being held, held to the walls of the thoracic cavity. Um, it, Luckily, the two pleura are separate, so you can actually collapse one lung and still have the other lung working. So um, if this happens, how are you going to try to deal with this person? How are you going to, what do you need to do? So you're on the battlefield and someone just got shot in the chest and one of their lungs collapsed. Luckily, it didn't go through their heart or anything, but they have a collapsed lung and you want to try to get them get them stabilized. What are you going to do? Try to patch the hole. Yeah, first thing is going to patch the hole. So you patch the hole and then what's the second thing you need to do? Reinflate the lung somehow. Right. Remember, you don't remember we, we said it. You don't want to think about inflating the lung, right? Because it's not positive pressure. We need the way you breathe is through this negative pressure. So what's what's not working here? What's wrong? That's keeping like right right now, 
I can breathe in and out as if there was, if air is in here, there's not, doesn't matter if my chest is moving because the lung is not going to change volume if there's no suction, right? The lung only follows the chest cavity if there's a suction in the, between the pleura. So what do I need to do to make sure I can start breathing again? Right, right. There's no suction because I've got air that's bled in in between there. So what do I need to do? Do you have to decrease the pressure somehow? I just have to I have to bleed out that air and restore the vacuum in there. Right. So you usually there's like some little valvey thing that they stick in there that lets air go out but not go back in. So you Kind of restore that suction and once you've restored that suction and block the hole then the lung is going to start working properly again because then when the chest wall goes in and out that suction's there and the lung will go in and out which will create you know your pulmonary ventilation your normal breathing so are there questions about that Can I, I want to reiterate, like, you know, don't forget kind of the causality, what causes what, because it's a little non-intuitive that the lungs are getting bigger, not because they're getting filled with air. Right? The lungs are getting bigger because the thoracic cavity muscles are increasing the thoracic volume. Because of that suction, it's increasing the volume of the lungs, which creates a low pressure zone in the lungs. And only then does air actually come into the lungs. Right? It's not the air comes in and makes them inflate. It's the lungs get big, creating a low pressure zone and the air flows in. Um, right, I can do, I can do it with my digestive thing. If I use my just abdominal muscles to change the volume of my stomach and I leave my kind of throat open, I can do, <coughs> right? Right, you know, the classic thing of, Burping on command is just expanding your stomach, creating a low pressure zone. The air rushes down into your stomach, and then you get <clears throat> right. That's the classic thing you probably all did as a kid. You didn't even know you were doing this kind of negative pressure thing to suck the air down into your stomach. So, but that's how your lungs work too. Your lungs expand, create a low pressure zone, and the air rushes in. And then when you relax, lower volume, high pressure zone, air, air leaves. <laughs>